Welcome everyone uh, to the weekly ARMA COVID-19 virtual town hall. Uh, we'd like to thank you all for taking time out of your evening to join us uh, for another very informative event. Uh, let's see here. Tonight's town hall is brought to you in part by ARMPAC. ARMPAC is the official PAC of the Arizona Medical Association and the ARMPAC board and staff work to identify and support candidates who listen to Arizona physicians and the patients they serve. Uh, you can learn more about ARMPAC at armpac.org. A little bit of housekeeping for everyone. Uh, this is a professional environment. We ask that everyone remain respectful towards all participants. The webinar is being recorded and will be published for you to view. Uh, we've been publishing them on our YouTube channel and sharing through our ARMA communications uh, link to them. Uh, you can see and hear us, but we cannot see or hear you. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is to make sure that you utilize the Q&A function throughout tonight to ask your questions. Please do not submit questions in the chat if you are able to find that Q&A button. Uh, and then the best viewing option for you is going to be by fitting the screen to your window as well as joining us on your computer. Uh, and for tonight's moderator introductions, we're going to have myself, Damian Johnson, um, direct, ARMA's Director of Communications, as well as Megan McCabe, ARMA's Deputy Director of Government Relations. Tonight's panelists include Senator Heather Carter from Legislative District 15, Representative Amish Shaw uh, from Legislative District 24, Dr. Ross Goldberg, ARMA's President, uh, Libby McDaniel, ARMA's CEO, John Amores, ARMA's Director of Government Relations, and Steve Barclay, ARMA's lobbyist. Uh, and at this time, I'd like to kick it over to Dr. Goldberg just to provide a quick update real, uh, from ARMA, and then we will move forward from there. Thanks, Damien. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, especially to our panelists for being here. Obviously, I'm not the reason why you're here for this. You're here to see them, so I'll be very brief. As always, we are working diligently on your behalf with all the issues going on. Uh, today is no exception to new news coming at every day. Uh, just to mention what happened today regarding with the modeling, and I know there's been some discussion and press on it. We are looking into the situation. We are getting further details. We will provide some better background once we have a little better detail and handle what's going on, but we are aware. And like everything else, we will do our due diligence to get that information and then bring that information to you in a timely fashion. I'm going to be done with that and hand it over to our excellent panelists because they're going to have some great stuff to talk to you about. So, Damien, I'm handing it back to you. Thank you, Dr. Goldberg. Uh, we'd like to go ahead and start with uh, Senator Carter. Would you like to provide us with a, a quick update for a few minutes here, and then we'll kick it over to Dr. Shaw. Happy to do that, and I will uh, provide you with the information that I have from the Arizona Senate, and then let uh, Dr. Shaw give you an update, perhaps with the Arizona House. And of course, um, it's my honor and privilege to be on this call with you. I just want to say thank you to ARMA for always bringing us together to have really important conversations about health and the delivery of health care in Arizona and your advocacy and commitment to not only the profession, but to your patients is to be commended. So I wanted to make sure I had a chance to say thank you. So as of right now, just to bring everybody up to speed, we are standing at recess in the Arizona legislature. And what that means is that we are still convened as a legislative body uh, in the traditional legislative session. So around the middle of March, when we started to receive data about the, uh, the pandemic, we took action in the legislature to put forth a state budget for this year, uh, for this coming state budget year, which starts July 1st, because we did not know when we would be able to reconvene. So that budget was passed and it was signed by the governor and it's known as, quote, the skinny budget. Now, what's a skinny budget? Basically, it's last year's budget with uh, a slight inflationary factor for uh, both caseload growth and statutory inflationary requirements. But other than that, no new spending. So just to give you a quick snapshot of the state finances, we went into this legislative session, the state was looking at a billion dollar plus surplus, meaning above 
the baseline of the budget we passed last year based upon incoming revenue. In a matter of 15 days, we saw our numbers completely taking a nosedive. And now, based upon the last Financial Advisory Committee report, the state is looking at anywhere from a $640 million deficit to a 1.2, excuse me, $640 million deficit to a $1.2 billion deficit. So that's a big swing, not only within the, the estimates, but also from where we were at at the beginning of the year to where we are at right now. So the legislature went into recess at, the, at that point in time, and we were scheduled to come back April 13th, which as we all know, we were in the middle of our stay at home orders. So the Speaker of the House and the Senate President extended the recess and has not set a date to return. So hot off the press, I'm assuming word is out because my phone is blowing up, so somebody knows, so I guess it's fair for me to say, that there is talk that we will quote, signy die, which means complete our work on Friday. That is what is being proposed right now. There should be a formal announcement coming shortly that we will return, at least in the Senate. I'm not sure about what's, in, what's happening in the House, but in the Senate on Friday to signy die. And what that means is that we will terminate all work in the legislature from this legislative session. So if there are bills still outstanding, those bills will be uh, dead for this legislative session. And then the conversation is around reconvening with a special session to address economic development and COVID-19 legislation. So that's hot off the press, but as with many things we've seen during this, this unprecedented time, you know, subject to change on a moment's notice, even perhaps by the end of this call, because my phone is firing up right now with lots of people either very happy or very upset about that action. So I might have a new update in a matter of 50 minutes. Thank you, Senator Carter. Uh, Representative Shaw. So, um, yeah, I um, similarly have gotten a lot of text messages in the last five minutes while Senator Carter was speaking. Uh, and um, I guess I've seen this movie before, so I, I'm not going to believe anything until I, I really see it coming from some kind of official channels because we hear rumors all the time and I, I Sometimes they're true, sometimes they're not. Um, so that the, the same thing that Senator Carter just talked about was was what uh, came through on my text feed as well. Um, I, I I have some um, and and with regard to the budget situation that that you talked about, um, yeah, certainly we, we're we're seeing a huge decrease in revenues, and that's going to cause um, that kind of deficit. It, it, clearly, this this is something that we're going to need to address. Some people have brought up this idea of a special session uh, just to deal with perhaps the budget and then maybe just deal with COVID-related um, other issues. And, and so in a special session, my understanding is that you can only really, the legislature can only really deal with the topics that were set forth in the rules for the special session. Um, so that may also be coming. Um, prior to just like five, se seven minutes ago, I, I would have told you that um, all of the options are kind of on the table. Um, <laughs> and um, so I, I'm, I, I think um, a lot more, I, I personally have a lot more questions than I do have answers for you with regard to what is eventually gonna happen with the legislature now. We do decide to sign and die. Um, I, I have some I have some mixed feelings about this because uh, a lot of the ARMA legislation that we worked so hard on for physicians it will just be killed off. And so that pains me uh, a little bit, but if it perhaps is in the in the greater good, then then I can I can kind of understand, you know, and I understand the thinking behind why that would be. Um, so that's it. I mean, the, the bills that, that we particularly care about were, were the, um, um, the one about uh, prior authorization that John Morris gets a lot of credit for um, and uh, creating a standard form. Um, and then just took a lot of work to, to get that there. And it's pretty unanimous. I've, I've actually already spoken to members in the Senate and um, put in a little, as well as the governor's office, and put in a little plea and said, you know, I've got some of these bills, they're kind of COVID related and, 
uh, many of them are unanimous and can we maybe think about getting them through and it may happen, it may not, um, you know, and, and that's just depends on what uh, people feel all throughout the chamber. So that's kind of where we are. So I, I, I don't want to see all those bills die. If that does happen, because it happens, we will try our best to bring them back next year or if allowed in the special session um, in some way. Great. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Uh, I just want to send a quick reminder to everybody that if you have any questions to please submit them through the Q&A button uh, on your screen. We'll go ahead and start off with a question that was submitted prior to tonight's event. Question here for uh, both of you. Is there any concern regarding the high number of unemployment causing a large number of uninsured individuals who can't afford medication and care. Uh, Senator Carter, would you like to go first there? Yes, thank you um, for asking that question. Here's what's becoming increasingly concerning and what I'm hearing from a lot of my constituents is that there are so many people that have either been laid off or furloughed from their place of employment. There are many business owners, especially small business owners, who have had to shut their doors and are suffering incredible financial hardships. You know, it doesn't take a lot of connections to know that, that, that one of the first things that people are concerned about is their health care, especially when we are in the middle of a public health crisis. So we are hearing that, yes, that is a concern. I know there's been a lot of conversations around you know opening up the marketplace again to allow people to purchase insurance to expedite claims through not only des for unemployment but perhaps access as well and if you think about it three state agencies in particular are taking the uh, enormity of all of the calls and that's des dhs and access and so yes there are there are processes we're trying to put in place, but back to sort of what Dr. Shaw was saying, we as a legislative body cannot take action legislatively unless we are convened and meeting. And so if we sign a die on Friday and we reopen into a special session that is called by the governor, that special session will declare the specifics of the topics that we need to address as a legislative body. And so we will be looking for things that will address COVID-19 concerns. And you know, perhaps that will be something in a special session call. Obviously that would come out of the governor's office. Um, right now, as we are standing in recess, there's nothing we can do other than helping connect our constituents with the services uh, as, they are, as they are outlined. Now, the good news is the executive has taken some pretty bold actions with executive orders. And so, you know, there's been a lot of work around, and I know I'm looking at the chat box while I'm trying to talk, which is always fun. You know, there's a lot of questions about telehealth and um, so all sorts of the delivery of care. So some of those things are addressed in the executive orders, but not all of them. And- um, Senator Carter, Dr. Shaw. Yeah, so I mean, I, it's a it's a concern it's specifically to the the question that was asked. That is a concern that we raised very very early on um, because, let's face it, we're unique. Um, the United States is a is a place that has a free market healthcare system. Um, a lot of the other Western countries that we see have a very different kind of system. People are covered through some some kind of uh, maybe non employer based situation. So when people lose their jobs and now suddenly we're we're looking at uh, a situation where um, they, they, I mean, it, you could end up with COVID and then end up with in the ICU and end up with a really large bill, or even, you know, even, uh, even if you didn't end up in that situation, you, you still would be worried about any other kind of health issue because it's just tied to employment. Um, those are, uh, so uh, as Senator Carter said, we're, we're not currently in uh, meeting at the legislature. The executive really has all of the authority. And part of our job was is to kind of 
act as a liaison to pass a lot of the concerns of our constituents on um, to, to them. And, and look, these are the kinds of things we're facing. The other thing um, that we did, I mean, weeks ago in, in response to exactly this was inform our federal representatives of, of this exactly. I, I happen to be pretty good friends with Greg Stanton. He's the one I always go to. He is my congressman and I, I always do go to him. He's extremely responsive. And, and that's, that was the first thing we said was said, well, what if, what if a whole lot of people lose their jobs and then suddenly don't have any kind of uh, access to insurance? Um, you know, um, and, and some of some people also won't qualify for access or Medicaid um, because they have something else, someone else in the family, you know, depending on your family situation, you, you can qualify or not qualify. Um, but it is a, a real and significant concern and one that we will need to address. Uh, probably, I figure, through some kind of federal le legislation rather than perhaps at the state level. Those are great answers. Thank you to both our panelists. Um, I'm going to turn to some of the questions that are being asked live. Um, one that came in is, will there be any attempt from the state um, to help physicians who don't see Medicare patients, for example, pediatricians? Uh, they are struggling financially, which I know is not uh, news to either of our uh, panelists, but um, your perspective on whether there'll be state help for them. Um, so I, again, I, I can... Um, First, direct people to this idea of the the SBA. I, I know we've we've talked before about small business loans possibly being available. Um, I know it's it's kind of in the, the Paycheck Protection Program. It may not uh, fall uh, straight into that program, but I, I th uh, as as a business, it may be possible to, to hopefully get some financial assistance. I also know that the last package that was 484 billion. Um, well, it replenished the, the SBA program and it had some, some uh, money in there just for, for hospitals and healthcare organizations, although I don't think it was specifically for physician practices. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 you, the question is whether this would happen from more of the state level. And that's a little hard. I'll, I'll ask Senator Carter what she thinks about this, but part of the problem is that the state has a limited amount of money to really work with. We're, we're talking about a $12.5 billion budget that we have every year. And then we're talking about, you know, a billion dollar surplus that we have, a billion dollar rainy day fund. And now, you know, our JLBC, the, the, the folks that produced these estimates for us had basically told us expect a deficit, but it was, the, you know, the range was so wild. It was like plus or minus $500 million. So, Given that that's the the sort of landscape out there, um, it's really I, I think it's really hard for the state specifically to to get in there and and address that because the the amount of money that would be necessary uh, it would be just so large compared to the state budget. So I think most of this again falls to the federal level, um, and that's that's my hunch on this. I mean, remember the the, the packages that we're talking about the. SBA package first time uh, was like $250 billion. And the next one was $350 billion. And again, we're looking at like, you know, a state that had a billion dollar surplus. So to compare the, the size and the scope of what's what's happening. And, and you know why a lot of this stuff ends up at, at the federal level, uh, as far as dollars are concerned, rather than the state level. But unless Senator Carter has, has um, some uh, more knowledge that I don't on this, no, I think you, I think you did an, an excellent job uh, describing the situation that we are in. And specifically what I'd like to ask from some of the members, because this is a, a common thread that I'm hearing, is that many of our Arizona small businesses, which of course are your physician practices, did not receive either a small business loan or a paycheck uh, protection program funding. And so what I'm trying to do is working with people like yourself to take that information and push that back to our federal delegation. And we've had some luck. A few have been able to kind of work their way through. And it's really frustrating because when you look at a state like Arizona and there, you know, there was a map that, that um, looked at the per, uh, I can't remember what metric they use, but basically the, the per population funding of the, of the SBA loans and the PPP loans, we were one of the, the 
states that didn't receive as much money as another state. And so I know that my constituents are telling me that they didn't receive the money. So I'd like to hear back, you know, just as a general group, and you don't have to say it on the uh, webinar right now, but maybe if John or Olivia, if you guys could collect that information, just as a, as a casual survey, who did you apply and did you get money? And if, if the answer is an overwhelming no, that can help inform our decision when we do go back to the Capitol because um, I can just tell you what other uh, emails I'm receiving, for lack of a better term, without getting too detailed, from other advocacy organizations similar to yourself uh, in the healthcare field are looking at all sorts of creative financing structures around maybe prepayment of, 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 of seeing patients based upon their previous caseload and what their previous uh, appointments were in their office. So there's things that we need to look at when we come back. And I will say this, this is my guess. And once again, this is changing moment by moment by moment. I know we're talking about one special session. I can't imagine we can get everything we need done in one special session. So without this kind of information from your organization, we, we won't have all the information we need to try and, and make those kind of decisions. So if we can get that information back from you, that will really help. I mean, the only other, the only other caveat in this, and I know um, uh, Dr. Seligman asked about telehealth, and I think somebody else asked about telehealth. Um, looking at the chat, uh, Dr. Jameson is asking about telehealth. You know, right now, that is prior to them re re uh, removing the restrictions on um, elective surgeries and seeing patients again. I mean, that has really been the mechanism for our offices to stay afloat. And so, you know, definitely use the telehealth services while they are available during the executive orders because that's been the lifeline, I think, of funding, unless the doctors on the call want to say otherwise. Megan, can I interject uh, to add to what uh, the, our uh, great representatives had to say? We've asked, ARMA went, got on board really early on in asking the Access Administration to push for um, CMS to uh, give them permission to do retainer payments. And retainer payments is the idea that Senator Carter was talking about a way for uh, providers that serve the access population to get some money up front. Uh, these, are, these are dollars that have been appropriated and are sitting in the state's general fund that could be put into play. And so we're trying to get permission from CMS to approve that. We've got our congressional delegation weighing in uh, on that as well. CMS so far is taking a wait and see attitude about seeing how the PPP money and CARES Act money uh, covers things, but we think there's gonna be a shortfall on coverage, particularly for the smaller practices. So we wanna keep pushing to get this, these retainer payments approved uh, so that those can be put into play. And this is uh, John and Morris. I'll just add that this week and into next week, we are starting to survey our members, um, and we have a mailing list of other kind of non-members, but we're gonna reach out as much as possible and get information on who has actually received uh, either PPP or CARES or any other kind of federal funds or not. So, so we'll, we'll start getting an idea about, you know, who out there is, is getting some assistance and be able to provide that because we've asked around and that kind of information is just, it's not available. If I could, if I could um, just jump in here before we go to the next question. John, as you get that information, even if there is a staggered release of it as it's coming in, if you could get it to us sooner rather than later, because yeah. I think things are going to move extremely fast. And I just know through just my context in my own legislative district, we have, it's almost like a horrible, perfect storm in the healthcare industry. They're at the front line of this pandemic, and yet they're also the, one of the financially hardest hits of this pandemic. I mean, when you think about healthcare as an industry, and you look at the last great recession we went through, it was one of the few industries that actually saw just a, albeit small, but healthcare and education saw slight upticks during the great recession. And now here we are in you know these 
devastating financial times and people think they want their healthcare system to be functioning, but you guys aren't doing this for free. You have to be able to pay your staff. You have to be able to keep your doors open. You have to be able to have all the resources you need to run your office. And I think that this is a critical area we need to focus on when we look at economic recovery packages. That's just my opinion. Great, thank you all. That was a very in-depth conversation there. Uh, I'm gonna jump to a next question here from uh, one of our participants tonight. Current evidence shows household mass decreased aerosolized shedding with breathing and talking, and along with hand washing can decrease community spread of asymptomatic COVID-19. Do you feel universal masks for indoor public settings should be recommended and gently enforced? Uh, I will let uh, Senator Carter, would you like to go first, sir? I'm going to punt it to uh, Dr. Shaw <laughs> first because I'm, I want to, I can share my screen, can I? Because I'm, I'm going uh, yes, to Shaw answer first and I want to show you what's uh, going viral on the, on the internet right now. You'll, you'll love this. So Dr. Shaw, you get to go first. Oh, go. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Well, so believe it or not, this, <laughs> this question um, came up about four weeks ago when I, I was actually talking to one of the folks in charge at Banner Health, and, and we'd actually talked about what is the science behind this. Um, and there, there was some, there was some, there's some conflicting articles that are out there, but, um, you know, I was able to find one that, that eventually talked about um, what happens um, with regard to aerosolization with a mask. Um, and it's, let's, let's put it this way. It is very unlikely to hurt anyone. Um, it may not be of the greatest benefit according to the, I, and I have the article somewhere. I'm happy to share it with John so you can put it on the, uh, the site or something. Um, but that it, it does have some effect with regard to how, far droplets will travel and, and how much they will get into the ambient air because a lot of the stuff will just get caught right in the mask. So while it's not, masks are not some kind of perfect solution, um, it, it seems that on balance they probably would help and uh, certainly wouldn't hurt. And so I, I think uh, generally speaking that I, I would be in favor. I, I certainly don't wanna see a bunch of people penalized uh, for not wearing masks. We've also seen some, uh, in the last couple of days, some ugly incidents happening. I don't know if Senator Carter, that's kind of what you're gonna refer to in a second here. Uh, somebody asking somebody to wear a mask and then wiping their nose on their sleeve, some, something like that. I, I saw some video from Michigan. Um, I certainly don't wanna see any of that. I, I, I want people to stay safe as possible and, and uh, I don't wanna see penalties. But again, it, it probably will keep other people safe if done at a at like a community or public health level. So yes, I, basically my answer is yes, I, I'd, pretty, I'd be in favor of something like that. Okay, I'm gonna share uh, what is going viral on the internet right now. Can you see that? <laughs> mm -hmm. So, I can just tell you that this is this is just my interpretation for mm -hmm. I'll let that hang up there for just a minute while I'm while I'm sharing my story here. When we first became aware of the disease, everybody started talking about it, what's going to happen, and then sort of like a tidal wave in the over the beginning of the year, you know, we we went through the first 3 months of Arizona which are thriving and we hit March which is um, you know, right in the spring training season, the height of our, our tourism season, and we shut everything down. And everybody was really taken aback. I think that there were, you know, people were genuinely afraid. They had no idea what was going on. They sort of, everybody said, okay, we're all supposed to go home. They went home. And then there has been this pent up anxiety. And right now, and I'll, I'll use the, the governor's, I'll stop sharing now. I'll use the governor's statistics that he says in his press conference frequently, you know, there's 30% of the people that are in favor of just open it all up. It's all about liberty and the constitution. 
and we should um, be peeling back all of the executive orders. And you can't watch the news without seeing that. There's a 30% of the population that are of the mindset, shut it all down. Everybody needs to wear a mask. Everything needs to uh, just be closed down until we have a vaccine that we can treat, trace. Now the new buzzwords are treat, trace, and treat. Wait, treat, trace, and trap. No. T, trace. There's a third T here. Help me, guys. I can't remember that's, the third three. Best T. track, trace, and totally isolate. That, those are my four Ts. But. I know, but there's a different, there's another T. Anyways, long story short, then there's the, there's, you know, the middle constituency, which is like, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to stay at home, but I go to the grocery store. Do I, am I, you know, I'm a little nervous about going to get my haircut this Friday, but I really need a haircut. I mean, these are real conversations that are, are being had. So when you say something like you must wear a mask and Dr. Uh, Jameson, you're my constituent. So I, you know, this is exactly the conversation we would have uh, individually. There will be people that will push back upon that extensively. And then there will be people that will choose to absolutely wear a mask. And what you'll see in the retail market, I predict, is sort of the same thing based upon the, some political leanings and availability of PPE. I think that's something we really need to talk about as well. But Costco, for example, is requiring you to wear a mask to go in. There was another retailer, and I can't remember which one it was. They are requiring you to wear a mask, but they're providing a mask for you to go in. So there are retailers that I think would be willing to say, yes, we should wear a mask, but they don't have, mask, they don't have PPE for their own employees. Uh, they definitely don't have PPE to supply to their, to their uh, customers. And so this is a really complicated um, situation that you're trying to navigate when trying to say, do we require a mask or not require a mask? When, as Dr. Shaw said, you know, we don't, the, the science is, we know it's not going to do any harm, but we're not really sure on what it will or will not do. Meanwhile, as we alluded to, there are people who are just wearing masks out walking my husband and I happen to wear a mask. We rarely see people wearing a mask. There will be people who will personally choose to wear a mask and there will be people who choose not to. And my hope is that as a society and as a community, you know, until there is some sort of a clear answer from the, from the science side of things that, you know, wear a mask if you want to wear a mask and don't judge me if I wear a mask and vice versa. Jamie, can I jump in for a second too? Because one thing I want to warn our panelists about is as I talk to physicians across the country, another thing that's coming up now is asking for a health exemption to wearing masks. Physicians are being asked to write notes saying, no, I have a health condition, I have asthma, I have this, I can't wear a mask. Um, so I warn people, they may be asked to do that from their patients. I am not giving advice on what to do. I have my own personal feelings about that. I do wear a mask when I go to and from anywhere. I live in a large apartment complex. I mean, there are, there are positive cases of COVID in my hospital right now. So again, this is, I think, a very interesting issue that we're talking about. One thing we didn't mention is there was actually someone murdered. A security guard was murdered, I think, in Michigan for asking someone to wear a mask, and that, that led him getting shot. So people are really extreme right now about this, and I think we need to be mindful and go by the science. But yeah, you're going to have people say that this is a freedom, and we can get into a whole discussion about that. Uh, but just be wary to our, our members. Your patients may say, I need you to write me a doctor's note to say I don't need to wear a mask. That is a real thing that is actually happening, just to let you know. And I think I'm going to add on to that. And that is what many of you probably already know this, but I'm in the College of Public Health at the University of Arizona. And so we are in the, obviously in the throes of all of this. And what I'm trying to advise my colleagues is that, I, I get it, you're approaching this from a, from a science perspective, but you have to be aware of the politics. And if you do not keep the politics, and, and you probably see me, most of you have seen me talk somewhere, and I talk about the politics, the policy, and where they overlap. If you are, if you are not taking into consideration the politics of this and how to navigate that, I think um, you know, that can create challenges for you as a medical professional and you are thrown into the fire on this issue. This is not one you are going to be able to uh, shy away from. You will need to be prepared. You will need to know what your answer is. You will need to know, you will need to be consistent. 
Um, and you, you will have patients who have a variety of different political views about this well, and you're gonna have to think about navigating that and, and how you wanna best advise your patients. I, I can tell you the issue about masks are incredibly contentious. The issue about what treatment works and what treatment doesn't work is now becoming a political issue. Uh, whether or not a vaccine is even warranted, needed, or if there is, are they gonna be mandated to get it? I mean, there's a constituency out there that is already, I guess this weekend was an, a big anti-vax convention. And their whole message based upon somebody who shared, I did not attend for the record, <laughs> I happen to firmly support vaccines, is that this is nothing but a hoax brought up forth by the pharmaceutical companies so they could develop a vaccine and market it and make billions. So as medical professionals, you have to be prepared to navigate this political landscape in a way that best serves your patients. I, I'm, I, I want to add to that just, just a little and to say that um, when we talk about that middle 40% that the governor had mentioned, and they're talking about um, they want reassurances, they're not sure which way to go. Um, they don't want to just be reassured by politicians. They actually want to be reassured by public health professionals, including this organization right here, the Arizona Medical Association. And part of what I want to say is that, yes, I, I agree with, with Senator Carter, but I also want to add that our organization here, for example, taking a strong stance on the vaccine issue is us putting ourselves out there on the side of science. Now, I mean, when the vaccines, I, I think that we, we, the majority of us in, in the organization will agree as to that being a scientific um, position that we, we are going to support every time. Um, with regard to the masks, we, we can have that conversation internally with regard to ARMA and, and what, what we think is, a, um, is an appropriate level of evidence to either talk about the public health implications of having a mask or not having a mask. But I also want to caution, we are also not afraid of the politics. We are the ones closest to the science. And even if that means that that makes a certain group of people mad, we, I, I'm also a member of this organization as well as a representative. And I'm gonna tell you, we, we shouldn't be backing away from who we are and what we know as, as people who interpret medical literature and then being able to put that out there with our credibility. The minute we start looking at the politics and then thinking to ourselves, we're gonna make decisions based on what the political pressure, well, we're not politicians, uh, we're, you know, the two of us are, but, but besides that, we should be thinking about our credibility being rooted in the solid science. And that's why I'm always gonna take it back to, I'm gonna provide you literature regarding what a face mask does and doesn't do. And I, and I think those are the ways in which we maintain our sort of credibility and, and closeness and not becoming um, folks that just uh, kind of wave whatever way the wind blows. Representative Shaw, I just wanna make sure you know, trust me, we will not have a problem stepping up and speaking when there's an issue. I can promise you that. Oh, I, I, I'm sure. <laughs> John, I John, think you're, uh, John, you need to unmute yourself. I, I see you're talking thank, to us. Thank you. That, you thank you. The only thing I wanted to add is there's a political discussion on masks. I'm not going to get into that. But it is very much established. There's not a constitutional right to not wear a mask. That is a fallacy. It is already established in the law and at the Supreme Court level that public health uh, allows you to impede upon liberties, and in this case, wear a mask. So I'm gonna leave the politics alone. Physicians and legislators have to resolve that, but what you posted, Senator, and what other people say, you know, I have a constitutional right. You may have other rights, but they're not grounded in the Constitution. Great, thank you, you everyone. Uh, some Damien, if you don't mind. Great and um, I just oh, want yeah. to highlight a little bit of conversation to use what John said uh, before we move on to uh, another question. Right now, the debate is specifically what John is talking about. What is constitutional? What is not constitutional? And the debate in the Senate, at least, I'm not sure what the House um, has been debating, but is do we completely rescind the governor's executive order declaring this an emergency? 
which has then a litany of uh, consequences or effects. And then that's option number one. Option number two is, do we change the state statute or at least pass a bill to change the state statute, I don't know if the governor would sign it, that would say you cannot discipline an individual or a business for failing to follow the executive order as it stands. And that is what we have spent the last 10 days debating. And so as of right now, the majority of the members in the Senate and the majority of the majority, according to the reports that I've received, support a straight signy die, which is to complete business. But as I'm on the call, my phone is fired up right now. There is a very vocal group of uh, lawmakers who are saying we need to rescind the governor's executive orders and we need to take away any statutory penalty for not following those orders. So if you care about this at all, I mean, like I said, this isn't a, this isn't necessarily a healthcare issue, but this is tremendously important to the healthcare industry and how we are going to navigate the rest of this pandemic. Yeah. And Senator Carter, just, just to touch on that real briefly, if the emergency declaration is rescinded, then among other things, it takes away the executive orders on things like telemedicine and on liability protections and on the hospital surge, on tracking and reporting to ADHS, the list is very long. And, and so and it would also have fiscal impacts on us in terms of some of this federal money. Once again, Great. those of you that have influence, if you know that one of those lawmakers is, is I, I, I think many of us would disagree with that sentiment. So I certainly do. And if, if uh, I mean, it, again, reach out and make your voice heard, whichever way you feel, um, if you have those um, feelings um, and, and one of those folks is, happens to be your lawmaker. Great, thank you everyone. Uh, I'm gonna move to another question here that was submitted uh, prior to the start of tonight's event. Uh, there, there's a little bit of background here with the question as well. Uh, there's a significantly rising tide of behavioral health needs in our community and state. At the same time, many of our larger safety net behavioral health providers are facing major financial setbacks, potentially resulting in furloughs and downsizing. At a time we need them most, some of our key behavioral health providers may not be around or may be seriously weakened and not able to provide the services needed. Certainly not on par with the amount of need. In the Medicaid system, access health plans and providers are collaborating, working hard to solve these problems, but are obstructed in part by the many compliance, regulatory, administrative requirements placed in the public system over the years. Uh, this is a tough question, but do you have ideas or thoughts about how to address this problem? Uh, Dr. Shaw, would you like to go first? I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask. I'm, I'm looking through the the uh, the the list of questions. Was it specifically about mental health? Is is that what we're we're talking about? Yes, this is a question that was uh, submitted just about an hour ago, I believe, before tonight started. Sure, I, I yeah, I, I didn't see it on the thing. Um, uh, it's it, yeah, Arizona has had. In my opinion, I just, uh, I practiced in other states. Uh, I was in New York for 10 years prior to coming here to Arizona. And there's a real night and day difference between uh, some of the other states and, and us with regard to how we provide mental health care. Specifically, we were talking through the last session about uh, how um, the, the pay parity just isn't there. And we're, we're not uh, making it possible for a lot of mental health care providers to come to Arizona and then be able to practice in 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 a way that that benefits the population of the state. Um, you know, I was glad to see the the omnibus bill went through. I'm not sure it, how that's going to affect the parity. To be quite honest, I don't, I don't have the details in front of me here. Um, although I know we talked about it uh, earlier in the year. Uh, I I agree. It's 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 certainly. Uh, the, the pandemic itself has certainly caused, uh, as far as I'm concerned, a, a rise. When when I think about 
spending time in the emergency department. I, I, by the way, I practice like once a week still, I still go to the ER and, and I still practice. And um, certainly you're, you're seeing that. Um, you're, you're not talking about, you know, the, the schizophrenia, the, the, the bipolar disorder, all the, all the, the usual sort of, uh, you know, mood disorders. I'm talking about more, a lot of people having uh, issues coping with a lot of the stressors that are, that are put on um, based on this because their family situation, their job situation, their unemployment and everything else that's been going on, including all the social isolation. Um, one of the things is that I think I, I've seen that telehealth specifically has has really exploded in the mental health care field, which which has been great to see. Um, you know, I I we we are we we tried really hard over the last couple of years to do that parody stuff over mental health, and I and I'm glad that that was sort of put into place. It, it's it's uh, and we will continue to do that. Uh, uh, but uh, what I can say is that I I agree it's it's a big concern and. In the same way, I, I uh, think we've just got to keep trying to bolster uh, the the system overall in Arizona. So I don't know if that directly addressed the question. Quite frankly, I, I think that I'm I'm I, I want to know if 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 there's something more specific that the uh, the the person was looking for when they asked. And and Damien, um, to piggyback on what Dr. Shaw said, if there is something specific that whoever asked that question can send to Dr. Shaw and myself, we are still in a situation where we can forward that information to the governor's office. And they have been very receptive about taking things that are a bureaucratic hurdle and figuring out how to navigate that in a way that works for both the provider and the patient. So if there's something specific, because that's what kind of stood out in that question, that they say that there's some hurdles, I mean, just look what they've done around down te around telemedicine. Now it took a little while, you know. It, it, you know, we kind of worked our way into that, and there's still a lot of questions. And by no means is it perfect, but I've seen an incredible willingness by the executive to work through that. And having that information would help us, should we ever go back into a special session, to be able to put that on the table as conversation as well. But we really need concrete details. Yeah. And we can reach out to our membership and have them provide that information for you. So that'll be one of the things that we'll take care of on our end as we continue forward. Thank you, Dr. Goldberg. Um, actually, interestingly, we had a question from um, one of the attendees this evening that sort of falls along those same lines. Uh, what question or issue do you most want to get addressed? Um, from the governor's office. So obviously we'll we'll ask our members what they want to see, but from your perspective as legislators, uh, what's your top priority for um, getting addressed here soon? Okay, I'm going to let Senator Carter go first because she did that to me last time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I was like, I hope, I hope Amish takes this one because, you know, the, the list is long. I mean, it really, yeah. it's, it's a long list. And it's not the fact that we haven't done a, a lot. It's that there's still a lot to do. I mean, we just, this is an ever changing situation. Every single day, we get new information, new data. And so we have to be willing to be nimble and responsive. I think, you know, what questions do you most want to get addressed by the governor's office? I'm not sure it's necessarily a governor's issue, but I am really, really concerned about the money that was basically promised to our constituents through uh, unemployment, to our businesses, through PPE, through the small business loan. I mean, I'm not, I, I hope this organization knows that I'm not one that just makes grandiose statements without something based in fact. And Dr. Shaw always holds me to the carpet when I'm like, nobody should support this bill. And he'll say, what's the science behind it? But from my neck of the woods and my little email box, all, the money is not getting to the people in Arizona like it was promised. It's one thing to not have, uh, you know, to not be able to uh, receive unemployment benefits if it wasn't promised to you, but it's not only not happening, but it's been promised to you. And so I think that, you know, that's number one. The good news is DES has been really, I mean, they're taking a, they're taking a hit out in the media right now. But every time I've responded, I've sent a constituent response to them, they have been on it and they have turned it around. I mean, they are doing, they are doing 
everything they humanly can to answer the calls. And I've even lost track of the numbers, but like in the first week, an average week was like 2,000 to 4,000 calls. The very first week they got 88,000 calls. Within like 10 days later, they were at close to 300,000 calls. And now it's like, I don't even know what the number is. It's, it's off the chart. So DES has been responsive when I've sent constituent issues to their office. But it's a lot of this is from the federal government as well. Um, and this money was supposed to flow to our, our banks and it was supposed to flow out to the people and I just don't feel like it is. So I don't necessarily think that's to the governor's office as much as it is to just government in general. Senator Carter, can I um, ask you to comment on this in the regard to, I've been hearing the number of 1.55 billion, maybe it's 1.6 billion in, in federal dollars allocated to the state right. that is sitting there and they're trying to figure out how to spend it. And they're not supposed to spend it on filling in for revenue losses. Right. So they're supposed to actually spend it in the ways you're talking about. Now there are a lot of mouths to feed, but what role does the legislature get to play in that as the appropriating body? And of course, I'd love to hear uh, Dr. Shaw's opinion on that as well. And, you know, so far the governor has been able to operate with the legislature out of session, but that's gonna change at some point. Right, and that's a really good question. And actually, there's a perennial bill that everybody runs until they decide they might wanna run for governor um, that says the legislature should appropriate all federal funds. So in Arizona, the executive appropriates federal funds as per whatever guidelines are, are brought forth by the federal government. So if you're interested in specific programs, because I really, I. I check back to the website on a regular basis, the JLBC website. So if you go to azleg.gov and you look at the JLBC tab there, they spell out, I mean, daily, they are updating the expenditures of the dollars that have come into the state from the federal government. So, so there, it is a very transparent system. You just have to know where to look. I mean, it's out there, but you'd have to know where to look. But now as we start to um, continue down the path, when we start looking at the state shortfall, Steve, this is where I think it's going to have a play for the legislature. The legislature is going to have to figure out how to make up the deficit immediately. We have a billion dollars in the rainy day fund, and I don't think that there's a lot of um, interest in just blowing through the rainy day fund in one fell swoop with one legislative action and hope that that takes care of it all. So there's, at the FAC committee meeting, which was two and a half hours, and I, if you're really interested, please watch it, but I don't imagine anybody would actually watch two and a half hours of the FAC committee meeting. Richard Stavniak said specifically that some of the money can be used to backfill, um, but there's a lot of pushback in the groups that would receive that money because they don't want to supplant state funding. So that's where the federal dollars coming to the state, where the legislature will take a role because they're going to have to figure out how we meet this, this shortfall, especially if we have to do it in a special session. We will have another FAC committee meeting in June, and that's where we'll have a, a more a holistic look over a longer period of time of what our financial situation is as a state. But specifically, the governor appropriates the federal dollars, especially while we're sitting at recess or signing die. I mean, Steve, is that kind of what you're hearing too? I mean, I... I call Steve when I want to get some answers too. So help me answer your question as well, Steve. Yeah, I, I think you're not getting a clear answer right now. And I understand part of it is they don't want to move too quickly. Uh, but on the other hand, we've got pressing needs. And we've talked about the fact that we've got doctor's offices, dentist's office are getting killed too. Uh, and uh, there's going to be a lot of folks probably in the, in the mental health arena, same thing. They're not going to be here in two months. And, and so if the money doesn't get into play, it's going to be game over for a lot of folks. And, and so I, I, we've been trying to press the governor's office as gently as we can, but as, as firmly to say, you got to get this money into play. Uh, we, you know, we can't let the, uh, the perfect get in the way of the good. Uh, time is not our friend here. Great. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Did you have anything to add? Yeah, so so to the original question, which which was what would I want to know from the governor's office or what would I ask them for, it it would simply be the the track and trace. I, I um, we I have I have heard uh, that the 
ADHS. In fact, I think it was on the ARMA call with ADHS that they mentioned that they had an initial program to get 400 people to do the, the kind of track and trace stuff. Believe it or not, I saw an email in my box um, from, I believe it was the county, Maricopa County, talking about that they were now hiring these uh, people to track and trace. Um, I think it would be really nice to know, to, to do that in a transparent way and say, okay, well, how many cases are out there? How many people need to get tracked and traced? How are we going to, what's a good plan uh, to do that uh, by, you know, having enough people to get around the virus? We, we want to end this thing. And, and that's a real win-win when we can say, we got around it, we contained it, uh, isolated people, and then the rest of society can kind of move on and and open up, and we don't we don't have to worry as much. Sure, outbreaks are going to happen. We all we need to do is look at those Asian countries that did exactly this, and then you can see they weren't completely free, but they're reopening and the, the public confidence is back because they were able to catch up to it and get around it. Um, I, I just so far have not seen very much with regard to like like details on what this plan actually looks like. Now I know in New York, uh, you know, I've heard that they're, they're hiring thousands. I mean like thousands and thousands. Of course they're at a different scale than we are. So we, we may not need more than 400, but I think I'd like to see some some kind of uh, uh, real real solidified plan here uh, and, and hopefully, Oh, I think uh -oh. we might have lost them there. Oops. I do think that um, here's what's really interesting, and it's kind of a, as he's probably logging back on, what's really interesting is you got to go back to your middle school and high school government classes. And the uh, relationship and the interconnected network between the federal government, states, and county health departments. And that's where, that's where we're going to see some of these efforts take place. I do know that the counties are, try, are scaling up around uh, hiring new people to do some of the, uh, the tracking and the contact tracing. The issue will become specifically like how quick, how fast. And I know Dr. Kara Chris has been making reference to that in the last few times I've heard her talk. But what we're seeing, this is just my opinion, we're not seeing the media pick up on that, so we're not getting that a lot of that reported. But Dr. Christ has mentioned it in every single in every single time she's been at the podium, and that's where I got the three T's: the test, the test, track, treatment. I put it in the I put it in the chat, and so she's working with the county departments on this. The media has not picked up the the tracking, and I know that that the counties are getting ready to scale up very, very quickly on hiring and do training um, and so forth. Thank you. Uh, real quick, Dr. Shaw, before I close out here, did you, since you cut out, did you have anything more you wanted to add towards the end there? Sorry, I don't know where, where I cut out in, in the middle of that, but I, I just, I think the point was made that I'd, I'd like to see that that effort be conducted in a way that the public has a lot of confidence in. I'm, I'm glad if they're doing it and the media is just not picking it up, then, then you know, I'm just glad they're doing it. And I hope they do it to the degree that, that will bring the confidence back. And Great. Damien, if I, if I can interject, just looking at the q and I definitely do not want to leave this call without talking about our uh, elderly community and our long-term care facilities. And we don't have to talk a lot about telehealth, but one of the questions Dr. Jameson asks is what do you want to see that sustains after the emergency order? And I hope it's telehealth. I mean, I genuinely hope it's telehealth. So, but I, I don't want to lose track of talking about our elderly patients in, in long-term care. Yeah, this is you. Libby. Um, um, yeah, and I, Damien, I, I'm sure that you, I'm, I'm going to transition this over to you because I know we're at the end of the hour and we have not gotten to all of the questions, but they are, they, we had great participation tonight and good engagement from the uh, attendees. Um, we will be responding to them offline for those that we did not get to, um, and Damien will kind of share a little bit of background on that. But I just wanted to personally thank Senator Carter and Representative Shaw for their time 
tonight, but also for just their overall support. They're such great healthcare champions um, of, of everything that we do in our state from a healthcare perspective and of ARMA overall. So thank you both for your time tonight. Thank you to all of the participants. And Damian, I will turn it back over to you. Thank you, Libby. Uh, so just as a quick little recap here, just so everyone's aware, the town hall tonight was recorded. It will be published on our website as well as our YouTube channel here in the coming days. Uh, if you have any further questions that may come up, please do email us at the communications at azmed.org. So it's azmed.org. Uh, and just a quick reminder as well of all of the resources that ARMA has on its website surrounding COVID-19, as well as other resources for Arizona's physicians, including uh, telemedicine, financial related resources, uh, COVID-19 FAQ, and our telemedicine guide that is free to download on our website. So we'd like to thank you all for participating tonight, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you.